preach to on Mother's Day. You always kind of struggle with that. Um, you know, you, you can, uh, of course, you can preach to moms. And uh, then it's like, all right, what are you, you going to say to them? And, you know, sometimes uh, we're guilty of making them feel bad on Mother's Day. We tell them all the things that they've done wrong or doing wrong, and, and uh, you know, that, I don't, that, that's what God wants us to, to do on, on Mother's Day. Um, we could preach out of Proverbs 31 and just a piece of the verse of verse 30, a woman who fears the Lord will be praised. And that, 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 that's a good thought. Remember, I like that because it says, and the woman, because we could preach to moms, but everybody here is not a mother. So we could preach to all women. You know, uh, that Proverbs 31 passage, you read the whole section, it deals with wives, but it also talks about mothers. And then that last verse that we read in verse 30 talks about women. Titus said in Titus chapter 2 that the older women should be teaching the younger women how to live, how to conduct themselves. And so that, that seems to be addressed to women. Sometimes we preach to the children. And I think that's always appropriate. Uh, preach to the children. Uh, the fifth commandment, I believe it's the fifth commandment. Honor your father and mother that your days will be long with the Lord. Um, so we can preach, kids, honor your parents. Honor your mother. Matter of fact, that admonition, that Old Testament, is also uh, repeated in the Gospels in Matthew. It's also repeated in Paul's letters to the church at Ephesus which shows that that is right all the time. It's not just an Old Testament idea. It's not, it, it is right all the time to honor uh, our, our parents. And really these things that, that are in the life of a woman that God honors are things that we all ought to uh, try to uh, incorporate into our lives. So I hope to address all of those today, but especially mothers. I want you to know that God blesses and honors godly mothers and godly ladies. Listen, in a day of loud and angry voices about uh, rights and bodies and babies and marriage and, and all kinds of things, I want you to know that if you are a lady who is doing her best to live for God, his voice isn't angry and hateful and mean, uh, but his voice is the voice of a loving, caring God who really does honor you. Amen. And I want us to look at, at Hannah's life in 1 Samuel, Samuel's mother, as an example of the kind of woman that God honors. Look at 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, and I'm going to start by reading verse 26 and 28. And that's kind of toward the end of the story. Then we'll kind of back up. And in verse 26, she has brought the young boy to the priest to fulfill her vow of dedication. She says, please, my Lord, as surely as you live, my Lord, I am a woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this boy. And since the Lord gave me what I asked him for, I now give the boy to the Lord for as long as he lives. He is given to the Lord. Then he worshiped the Lord there. They worshiped the Lord there. Now you remember the story of Hannah. 
Hannah was a woman who understood, and as I think about women that God honors, listen, Hannah was a woman who understood grief. Everything wasn't perfect. She understood what it was to want and to desire and to be mistreated. In verse 8, uh, the Bible says it there in 1 Samuel chapter 1, uh, the question uh, from her husband, Hannah, why are you crying? Why won't you eat? Why are you troubled? Well, just before that, we, we see that, that that she was in a, a, a household and Old Testament and, and uh, not the message for today, but there were two wives. That, that ought to be the hint there's a problem. <laughs> Potential for problems. Listen, TV shows today, sister wives, they don't have nothing. Uh, but Hannah didn't have a child and she wanted a child and the other lady there in the home made fun of her because she was childless and put her down and, and, uh, and beat her down because of, the Bible said her rival would taunt her severely. Let me just ask you ladies, whatever's going on in your life right now, do you feel that God has abandoned you? because of your circumstances? Do you somehow feel like you don't measure up because you're not perfect? Listen, if you have a hurt that comes because you're not perfect, that doesn't come from God. Okay. If you feel like that you don't measure up, listen. We know, we know two things about that. Number one, we know that there's not one of us to measure up. But we know that he loves us and he blesses us when we strive for him. You, you may look at your circumstances and, and things aren't how you want them to be in your life, in your marriage, with your kids, whatever it is. You just unhappy with your circumstances and, and you're grieving because of that uh, Hannah knew what that was like we know from these verses all through it, it Hannah was a godly lady I mean she prays she sacrifices she goes to the temple she Yet she had this deep hurt. But because she was godly, God honors that. She, so, so she was a woman that understood grief. She was also a woman who prayed. In verse 10, deeply hurt. There it is again. Deeply hurt. Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears making a vow. And she came and she was praying. She's on her face for God. And out of, out of her grief, she prayed. Now, now that, that is a lesson for all of us. What do you do when your dreams haven't worked out like you thought? Well, there are some people, they abandon God. They abandon church. They abandon... It's not fair, it hasn't turned out, so I'm quitting. Not Hannah. She prayed. She went to God. I, you know, what, do, you, do you see something of the New Testament here? Under the law, when you wanted to pray, and, and you, you know, you, you go to priest, you share with him, you tell him, you... New Testament, Jesus says that he's our mediator and every one of us, men and women, have direct access to God. Amen. Hannah knew that 
in 1 Samuel. She didn't have to go to anybody. She could go to God and pour her heart out to the Lord and that God would hear her. She prayed, I, I kind of like this, and I'm going to kind of read something into what was going on in verse 9. On one occasion, Hannah got up after they ate and drank at Shiloh. The priest Eli was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. Deeply hurt, Hannah prayed. Everybody else was busy with life. They finished the meal. Priest leaned up by the post. They're, you know, they're kind of enjoying the, uh, the, the afternoon. You, you watch Andy Griffith, they're out on the porch. Okay? Everybody's busy with life. Hannah didn't run around saying, oh, y'all need to pray for me. She went and prayed. Everybody else busy with the life. That's okay. Many, maybe some of them didn't know about her heart hurting. But she knew who did know and who did care. And she went and, and prayed. She prayed along. You know, there are some prayers that you can only pray by yourself. This last Wednesday night, we, we looked in, uh, in the scriptures in 2 Timothy, uh, in just the first verse, when he says to make your prayers or your, your petitions and your prayers and your intercessions and your thanksgiving uh, to God. And we're talking about four kinds of prayers there. And the first one, your petitions. That is the same word that over in James that... Fervent prayer of the righteous man that availeth much. That's the same word for petitions. Fervent prayer. This, this is talking about prayer that comes from the gut level disappointment, hurt. Many of those things that they are so deep and hurting. When even your best friend says, how are you doing? You smile and say, I'm okay. And you're not okay. And there are things that you just can't, you don't share in prayer time. You don't share, because they're just, they're down here. But when you bring those things to God, he hears. And I think that's where Hannah was. Hannah didn't need anybody else right now. She just needed her Lord. Aren't you glad that you have a Jesus? That when you have, matter of fact, the Bible says sometimes we don't know how to pray as we are. But when we come to those times, the Holy Spirit himself <coughs> makes intercession for us with groanings that can't be uttered. Wow. There's not, I don't even know the words. I hurt, and something has to be done, and, and I need an answer, and I need help, but I don't even know what it is that I'm asking. You ever been there? And, 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 and you just come before God, and maybe all you can say is, Oh, Lord. And then you're at a loss for words. But the Bible says when we come to those times that the Holy Spirit yeah. takes those groanings and hurts and aches delivers that as a perfect prayer for us. Wow. I think that's where Hannah was in this prayer. Matter of fact, she prayed with abandon. In verse 13, Hannah was praying silently, though her lips were moving. Her voice could not be heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to be drunk? Get rid of your wine. 
He was watching her. And bless his heart, the preacher, you know. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something that you've never suspected. <clears throat> Pastors sometimes can be idiots. <laughs> Don't laugh. I know why, I know what that laugh meant. Huh? You just think we've never thought that. <laughs> Yeah, you've all thought that. And it's true. Here's Eli. And he didn't look at her and say, oh, look at Hannah. She is distressed and disturbed and just on her face before God. No, he said, she must be drinking. <laughs> because I see her mouth moving. I don't hear any words coming out. And... Now, here's what I want you to understand. Hannah didn't care. <coughs> this was not a prayer for show. This wasn't a prayer for other people to see. This was not a scripted, written, well thought out time of prayer and devotion for God. Her heart was broken and she was before God and just pouring out her heart. To what she prayed with abandon. Oh, that we would have people who would pray with abandon. We get so scared. I think sometimes Baptists are the worst at getting scared. We're afraid. What if, what if the preacher sees me in there praying and no sounds coming out, my lips are moving? What's he going to think? Well, bless his heart, just pray. See, we're, 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 we're afraid. What, what if somebody gets happy and raises their hands? Bless our heart. You know, we're so afraid to reach out to God with abandon. You know, abandon means I'm not worried about how it looks. I just know what I need. And I'm not even sure I know what answer I want. But I know enough about God. To trust his answer. Do you trust God that much? Do you trust God enough to say, God, whatever it looks like, I want you to fill me with your spirit. Lord, whatever it looks like, I want you to fill our church. Abandon. God honors that kind of prayer. She was a woman who sacrificed. Now, early in the story... Uh, you know, that they were, they had offered sacrifice. And then in verse 21, well, she prayed and she says, I kind of left out the best part of the story. She prayed for a son. And God gave her one. Praise the Lord. God gave her what she asked. And right after the birth of that child, the family is going up to make their annual sacrifice and offering to the Lord. <clears throat> and Hannah said, paraphrase part of the story, I've got this baby. I'm not going. But when he is weaned, I'm going to take him as I promised and fulfill the vow of giving him to the work of the Lord. And her husband said, I like this. It, th this shows that he's learning. It shows something about he knew what kind of lady she was spiritually. He trusted, get this, he trusted 
her spiritual walk with God. So don't we get all caught up? Well, the husband's supposed to be the spiritual leader. The husband's supposed to be the spiritual leader. And his husband was a spiritual leader. He's leading them out towards. But he also knew that Hannah has a walk with God that is just as vital, just as real, just as powerful as he is. So we'll proceed. How do you know that? Because he just said, do what you think is best. May the Lord confirm your word. In other words, he was saying, I trust you to hear from God and to do what God wants you to do. Now, I don't know about you, but isn't that kind of awesome? And isn't that kind of contrary to what a lot of people say about us and what we believe? And I think, I think that's significant. He trusted her. She understood grief. He had watched her pray and watched her lie. Verse 25, verse 24, when she had weaned him, she took him to, with her to Shiloh, as well as a three-year-old bull, half bushel of flour, and a clay jar of wine, though the boy was still young. Uh, she took him to the Lord's house at Shiloh, and they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the boy to Eli. She sacrificed. She brought the bull, she brought those items for sacrifice. She's taken the son to deliver him to, to Eli to be raised there at the Lord's house. And she brings sacrifice. Sacrifice was a part of her life. Spiritual sacrifice, but also sacrifice in her own life. Question I had. Never have thought about this before. You know, when you're raised in church and you hear these Bible lessons all your life, sometimes you don't question some things that you ought to question. And I'm not talking about doubting kind of questions. I'm just kind of, how old was Samuel when she took him to Elon? Well, it was after he was weaned. I think we can read a little bit more. He was able to be away from his mama. Many commentators say probably three to five years old. You've heard the saying, everything I needed to know that was important I learned in kindergarten. You know, they really say that, that children have developed a large part of their personality and the kind of by the time they're five years old. And, and that's kind of true. I, I, I think you, that they break, you, you kind of see that. Now some of you right now have a, a four or five year old you're thinking, oh no. <laughs> but really, <clears throat> by the time a, a kid's four or five years old, you know, if they're going to be tender-hearted, they're probably tender-hearted four- and five-year-olds. If they're rough and tumble, they're probably going to be rough and tumble four- and five. I mean, that, that's just, uh, you know, little girls, four or five years old, they're little princesses. Bless your heart, they're going to be 15, 16-year-old little princesses. I mean, that just, which, by the way, really shows us the importance of what mama and daddy does with those little ones. How important it is. And to pour 
pour into them because they're, they're little sponges and they're soaking in and, 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 and it's shaping their lives. And, and I say that because I believe although Samuel was just maybe four or five years old, what his mama had taught him was already taken root. When she takes him there to dedicate him to the Lord. Moms, dads, have you consciously given your children to the Lord? I mean, have you consciously got, I've done the best that I can do, but I've given them to you. I, I mean, really, we well, all do that at birth. Really, y'all do that before they're born. Make that vow like it, but, but you give them to the Lord and then nurture that so that when the time comes that they're in the Lord's hands, uh, you've got to give them good sort. Matter of fact, uh, Proverbs uh, 22. And when I first read this in the Christian standard that I use, I didn't like it. You know, King James, train up a child the way they should go and whether they'll live. The Christian standard says, start a youth out on his way. Yeah, I didn't like it. It's not near as poetic. But you know, the more I've studied about what it means, about training up a child the way they should go, the more I like that. But I'm going to give you a little, little quick lesson. It, it might have been James Dobson, the first person that I read that said this. Your child is bent. You, you ever remember reading that? I think he's got a chapter in one of his books. But he's talking about, he's not talking about this. He's not talking about that they've got some problem, they're bent. But he's talking about the way that God created them. Every person is created with natural talents, gifts, likes, dislikes. Now this makes it even harder for us as parents because what he's saying is that we need to figure out what our kids' natural inclinations are and then help them start them out the way they should go. <laughs> Don't you see how much harder that is? Because that means we usually enter, train up a child in the way I want them to go. That's not what it says. And there's a lot of very frustrated parents because they're trying to force their kids. Listen, any of you got any left handed kids? Early on, did you struggle with that? You're trying to get the crayon in this hand. And they switch it and put it in this hand. And so you say, no. And as soon as you step away. And finally, somewhere you figure out.
You bought him a little glove and a little ball and a little bat because he's going to be a big leaguer. Except he doesn't like sports as he starts growing. And you take him to the boys club anyway and you sign him up. And he hates it. And you're frustrated? But what he really likes is he really likes to draw and color and paint things. But since you don't know how to do any of that and you think you know how to play a little bit of ball, you're trying to make him do this when you ought to be nurturing and helping that direction. So that's what it is for a kid to have bent. We've all got our natural inclinations. And our task as parents is with God's help to pray and discover some of those and then help them. I've got two boys. One of my boys played his first organized sport when he got to college and the BCM had a softball team. I've got another one who from the time he could walk had a ball in his hand. You know, throwing it and chasing it and wanting me to throw it with him. And, uh, and so he, he, did all, he did all that. And that's okay. See, I was thankful that I'd been taught a little bit. My mom and daddy, one thing, they, they did a lot of real good things. You can tell by looking at me. They did a lot of good things in raising their kids. Uh, don't look at my sister, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't even know what they were doing. I didn't know they were doing anything. But they were always happy and encouraging in what we like to do. If that was playing sports, okay. If that was singing in choir. That was playing in the band. Whatever, listen. My daddy couldn't hardly play a radio. He was musically challenged. You know, when I was in bed, he encouraged me. And, and, you know, they sacrificed and scraped the money together and bought me a, a trumpet and, and took me to practices and band camps and uh, why? Well, I didn't know it. I don't know if they knew it directly, although they knew it intuitively. They were helping me grow according to my natural bents. Are you doing that? Mom's and dad's. Hannah's. We have a great task. Hannah did that and then take, took her son, dedicated Samuel, to the Lord. God honors women like him. I mean, including her story. Jesus modeled for us when Jesus is on the cross and suffering the pain and anguish and agony on the cross and he noticed his mother stand there watching her son and he looks over at John and he says John behold your mother what was he doing he was giving John the responsibility, you take care of my mama. 
My wife, John's going to take care of you. Because there was an honor that was given. Mother's death. No, no apologies, but I'm not a mom. I, I know which bathroom to use, okay? I, I'm, not, I'm not a mom. I'm a, I, I, I know I'm different. I don't understand all that mamas face, but I learned very early in my ministry that Mother's Day isn't a happy day for some women. And sometimes our preaching makes it worse because they leave feeling like failures. I want you to know today, if anything that I have said makes you feel like a failure, just know this, that was the idiot preacher's words. That wasn't God. Oh, listen. God loves you and honors you and uh, and has a has a place for you. Again, like Hannah, Hannah, Hannah didn't need her husband's prayers, although I'm sure she had Elkanah's prayers. She didn't need Eli's prayers, although Eli blessed her after he figured out what was going on. But she had a walk with God. And when she had a need, she could go to God and pray. Listen, if tomorrow the doctor called me and told me something in my life uh, health-wise was, was falling apart, uh, and I started calling people to pray for me, there would probably be more ladies on that call list than there are men. Because I believe in your prayers, too. And blesses. And Hannah's greatest reason for being honored and blessed was she had a heart toward God. She wasn't perfect. Sometimes her tape wasn't cued to the right spot. As Karen slipped to take care of being grandma. But Aren't you glad they got it queued up to the right spot? Amen. God doesn't need perfection to use us. He just needs us. Lord, here I am. And he blesses and honors. Let's pray together. Children, honor your parents. Be extra good today and tomorrow. Clean your room. Tell them you love them. Husbands, the Bible says husbands are to love their wives like Christ loved the church and died. For it. Husbands, love your wives that way. Lord Jesus, I pray. God, there may be someone here today that don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Or they don't know how to turn to God in prayer like Hannah did because they don't have a relationship like that with God. So I pray that today would be the day they come to know Jesus as their Savior. Lord, teach us how to honor those who are deserving and to love and to care for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You join